Hello, my name is Greg Durrett. Welcome to Natural Language Processing. In this segment, we're going to talk about the overall outline of the course and the broad goals. So let's start with what the goal of Natural Language Processing, or NLP as we're going to call it going forward, is. So NLP is about solving problems that require deep understanding of text. And I'm going to talk about deep understanding in contrast to shallow understanding, things like string matching or regular expressions that you might have learned in earlier programming courses. Uh, and we want to understand a little bit about the kinds of things that we want to build that require this deep understanding and why they, want to, and why they require that. So for example, we want to build systems that can talk to us, like dialogue systems, machine translation systems, automatic summarization systems, et cetera. And so you know, we'd like to be able to have a conversation with our phone that goes like this. Hey, Siri, what's your favorite kind of movie? Just sort of conversational, right? Um, and Siri says, I like superhero movies. And then you say, OK, what's come out recently? And Siri says, The Avengers. So we'd like to be able to have a conversation with a personal assistant like this, be able to have a back and forth, and get some information out of it. Uh, and in order to do this, this system needs to be able to understand what we're saying, respond appropriately, and then in some cases be able to retrieve information, like for example, a list of movies that have come out recently. So why does this require deep understanding? Well, you're never going to be able to write down a whole big set of rules that are going to encapsulate all the possible flows that the dialogue might take. Right? The system needs some way of uh, recognizing what we're saying beyond just some kind of rules or templates, and then knowing how to respond to it. So translation is another great example of this. Um, so here's a sentence in Chinese and uh, a corresponding translation from Google Translate. So the interesting thing here is that you, know, you cannot just go along and translate this sentence word by word. In particular, uh, in the first chunk here, the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee, that's this first segment, um, which is followed by July 30th, which is followed by hold a meeting in Chinese. That's roughly what we call glosses of those, uh, those little phrases. And that's out of order from with respect to how it's ordered on the English side. And so in this translation process, we actually need to uh, look at the syntactic structure here, understand the, you know, the kind of concepts being communicated, and be able to render them in the right surface order. We can't just apply a dictionary and go along um, kind of word by word. So again, we need this deep understanding here. Uh, and a final example I'll give is systems that extract information and answer questions. Um, if you type, when was Abraham Lincoln born into Google, um, something like the following is going to happen. Uh, we recognize that born means, OK, we've got a big database of people and names. And we need to map the idea of someone being born to like this birthday field in the database. Um, that doesn't sound all that complicated, but you know, once you get uh, a large database with a whole bunch of different columns and many, many ways of asking about them, it actually becomes a fairly involved problem. And then you know, we need to retrieve the right birthday from this database with some sort of computation. It gets even trickier when you ask about things that aren't in a database. For example, how many visitor center are, centers are there in Rocky Mountain National Park? OK, you could theoretically have a database that stores this information, but I guarantee you Google does not. And so instead, what we need to do is retrieve some information from the web using something like Google Search, and then try to find a relevant snippet and answer the question based on that. So in this case, the third paragraph of the Wikipedia article has a sentence that tells us the park has a total of five visitor centers. And so um, we're going to learn techniques in this course that are going to allow us to understand this pipeline, how to retrieve this information, and then answer questions based on these snippets. OK, so this kind of tells you the sorts of things that we want to build, and I think gives you an idea of why these problems might be hard. So let's talk a little bit about the standard NLP methodology for doing this. So our starting point is text. In this course, we're always going to start with 
text rather than speech input. Uh, there's a whole ton of interesting work that does use speech. And in general, you know, we're going to assume that if you wanted to use speech, you could run something like an off-the-shelf automatic speech recognition system first. All right. For the first part of the class, we're going to talk about a set of tools for producing text, what we call text analysis. Uh, and this is going to be layers of annotation on top of this text, like syntactic parses, understanding the syntactic structure of the text, co-reference resolution, understanding which pieces of the text refer to the same real-world concepts, entity disambiguation, figuring out what those concepts are, understanding the discourse structure. And so in general, we have a whole set of tools available that are going to allow us to understand a little bit more of this deep structure of text so we can start to get at some of these things that we want to do. And then that's going to enable us to do all these cool applications like summarize things, extract information, answer questions, identify sentiment, translate the text into another language, et cetera. And so throughout this course, we're going to tackle all of these problems with the, you know, under the kind of broad umbrella of statistical approaches using machine learning. All of these things require dealing with complex open domain text, and the only way we know to reliably do that is to learn models from large-scale data. All right, so Let's talk about how we represent language. So in this kind of first text analysis piece, what do these representations look like? So we're going to start off the course by thinking about labels. Um, so for example, if we say the movie was good, it's going to have a discrete sentiment label that's just going to say this is positive sentiment. We might have a statement like Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. This is subjective. We might classify statements as subjective versus objective. All right, and there's a whole bunch of other different types of, of labeling schemes we might use. Another layer of annotation looks like either sequences or tags. Uh, and this is where we're going to go after labels. We're going to start to look at text as a structured object, and we want to be able to recognize that, in this case, the span Tom Cruise is a person and Mission Impossible is a work of art. Uh, and this is a task called named entity recognition, uh, we're also going to look at things like part of speech tagging that analyze text sequentially. Uh, and from there, we're going to move on to tree structure. So this is really one of the distinguishing features of, of language is the fact that it has this recursive hierarchical syntactic structure. And so we're going to understand what parse trees like the one here look like uh, and how to understand them and how to predict them. We're also going to look at uh, semantic representations like lambda calculus here. Um, this is another sort of tree structure that uh, builds an expression to represent this idea of flights to Miami, which could be executed against a database. So taken together, these are, this is going to give us a set of tools for understanding these different structures of language. And for each tool, we're going to see what machine learning techniques allow us to predict it and deal with it. All right, so now we've got these representations. How do we actually use them for these downstream applications? So we're going to zero in here on the case of trees, and I'm just going to give you a brief flavor for how this kind of thing is going to come up. So early in the course, when we think about feature-based linear models, one thing that trees might allow us to do is to extract some sort of syntactic feature for classification. Later, when we think about neural networks, uh, a cool thing you can do with trees is actually build your neural network to have some sort of tree structure. Uh, and when we think about machine translation, one thing we might do is actually model the translation process as a mapping from a syntactic parse in one language to a syntactic parse in another language. Um, and this is uh, the, the model to do that is something called a tree transducer. So there's a whole bunch of ways that these analyses of text can impact our modeling. Of course, the, the elephant in the room uh, is that with the rise of deep learning and neural networks, there's an increasing trend towards building purely end-to-end -end models. Uh, and so there's going to be this tension throughout the course of, you know, do we use these intermediate pieces of text analysis or do we build models strictly end-to-end? -end? Um, 
And the answer is not going to be clear cut. There have been huge successes from purely end-to-end -end models, but there's also a lot of interesting kind of cutting edge work right now that is starting to move them back towards uh, incorporating this kind of discrete structure for reasons of interpretability or controllability. And so this is a topic that's going to come up again and again throughout the course. So we have to think about also why any of these predictions is hard. So uh, you know, I mentioned that we're going to need to build some sort of statistical models for mapping both from text to these analysis layers and then also going from the analysis layers to the applications. And the reason this is hard is because language is complicated and language is ambiguous. Uh, and so in order to understand that a little bit more, we're going to talk about what ambiguities we need to resolve and what ambiguity means in this context. All right. So we can look at a, a, a sort of apocryphal headline here. Teacher strikes idle kids. All right. So this is, this is kind of funny. At least it's, it's funny to me. Uh, because there's two interpretations of it. And despite the fact that we, when we look at this, we probably know what the author meant. Uh, we still get this other reading. Um, so what the author probably meant was that teacher is a noun and strikes is a noun. Um, idle is a verb. This is a sort of unus unusual usage of it. Uh, and then kids is a noun. OK, but you could also read it as teacher is a noun, strikes is a verb, idle is an adjective and kids is a noun. And so you know, the second interpretation, of course, is that the teachers are, are really fed up with these kids who are idle and just pow. And so I talked about sequential analysis and part of speech tagging, which we're going to see uh, you know, early on in this course. And that's essentially about resolving the which interpretation of the sentence we want to get. All right. Uh, ban on new dancing on governor's desk. All right, so we could think about this in the context of the last example. Like, what are the parts of speech here? It turns out that actually the parts of speech aren't really that ambiguous in this case. What's ambiguous is the syntactic structure. What the author intended is that uh, we have two prepositional phrases here. Um, we have a ban that is on nude dancing, and that ban on nude dancing is on the governor's desk. But the sort of funny interpretation is that we actually have this noun phrase concept of nude dancing taking place on the governor's desk. OK, they would probably want to ban that too, uh, but that's neither here nor there. So the ambiguity in this case is a higher level syntactic one of how these different pieces compose. It's not a low level part of speech ambiguity, but instead one that we're going to have to understand syntactic parsing in order to deal with. All right, and let's look at a third example. Iraqi head seeks arms. Actually, in this case, we don't have either of these ambiguities. The, the parts of speech are totally clear. Um, and the syntactic structure, it turns out, is clear as well. Um, what is ambiguous is the, is the sense of the word, uh, is the sense of the word head. Is it someone's head or is it like a head of state? And then similarly for arms, uh, is it, you know, someone's arms, or are we talking about weapons here? So in this case, we have a more of a semantic ambiguity that arises from the different senses of these, these words. OK, so what we've, what we've seen here is that there are a bunch of these sort of binary ambiguities, right? There's two possible interpretations of something, and we need to pick between them. And this is what statistical models are going to allow us to do. 
And the reason NLP is hard is not because there's two possibilities, but actually because there's an exponentially large number of them. And so we're going to need really powerful models in order to reject all of those bad possibilities. Um, so we're going to think about a translation example here, il fait vraiment beau, um, which roughly means it's really nice out, or it's really nice, or the weather is beautiful. There's actually lots of different valid translations of this. But if we think about, even for this four-word sentence, what could happen, you know, it is really beautiful outside. That's another possibility. Um, if you go word by word and translate this, he makes truly beautiful. This is actually something that, you know, is totally valid translations of each of those four words. Of course, it absolutely does not make sense and is not what uh, the speaker or writer of this intended. Or it fact actually handsome, another case. So, a lot of times when we look at these, these examples of ambiguity and we say, oh, haha, ha, there's two interpretations. No, in fact, there's, you know, billions of interpretations and uh, our, we're going to need structured models that can reason about them and, again, are very statistically powerful so they can pick the right one out of all of these possibilities. Okay, so in order to understand those kind of models and uh, situate what we're going to be looking at with respect to history, we're just going to take a very quick uh, cruise through the timeline of NLP. Um, so our timeline is going to start in the 80s, late 80s, with the so-called AI winter. Uh, and so systems at this time were largely non-statistical. They were either rule-based or expert systems. And so, you know, the, the history of AI has been about there's progress, and then there's periods where we sort of hit a wall, and then uh, progress happens again. And so this was one of those periods of cooling off where there was less interest, sort of a wall was hit. In the early 90s, uh, researchers at IBM did some of the earliest work on statistical machine translation using uh, the proceedings of the Canadian Parliament, which was uh, a whole bunch of aligned data, so sentences that are, were, in, in this case, in French and English, uh, that corresponded to each other, and they were able to build a statistical translation system out of that. So this, as well as the development of the Penn Tree Bank in 1993, which was one of the first large-scale corpora annotated with syntactic information, are two of the sort of first instances of well-known, successful statistical modeling uh, efforts. And so uh, the Penn Tree Bank, once that data set existed, uh, started leading to people building things like part of speech taggers uh, and syntactic parsers and saying, oh, hey, wait, it looks like having all of this data is actually useful. And so then this led to an explosion of interest uh, in things like supervised learning, um, support vector machines, uh, conditional random fields applied to tasks like named entity recognition or sentiment analysis. So we started to understand that data was really useful and machine learning could help us harness the power of that data to uh, solve some of these problems. There was a lot of interest also in unsupervised learning, um, things like topic models and grammar induction. We're not going to talk about these so much in the course. Uh, they sort of ended up, up kind of falling off in terms of the, the overall interest in them. Uh, people started becoming more interested in, okay, how do we combine labeled and unlabeled data? Uh, and then this led to, uh, in 2014, 2015, the, the neural revolution. And then um, following that, the kind of revolution in pre-trained models we've seen with things like uh, BERT and GPT. So those models are great at this task of, of harnessing all the data on the web, as well as whatever supervised corpus you have for the task that you want to solve. And so this, uh, what's here in this box, is the techniques that are going to be the focus of this course. So we are going to focus on supervised learning, uh, semi-supervised methods, and neural network models. And the kind of common thread of all these models is that they are going to be able to handle ambiguity by learning how to map from input text to linguistic representations uh, using data. And that's going to allow us to start to tackle these issues that we saw on the previous few slides. So 
to just give a brief sense of where we're going and the outline of the rest of the course. Uh, we're going to start by talking about classification. We'll start with linear classification and then very quickly move into neural uh, and talk about word representations, which is a really important uh, kind of ingredient for how to actually take string-valued language data and convert it into something that machine learning can use. Then we're going to talk about te these text analysis tasks, like tagging and parsing. And we're going to talk about the structured models that uh, can deal with these tasks. Then we'll talk about language modeling and pre-training. So once we've seen this, we really need to kind of build up the idea of language models, which are going to establish the idea of recurrent neural networks and things like that for sequentially predicting text. Uh, and then pre-trained models are going to inform how we think about uh, building models for the course going forward. Um, we'll then go into question answering and semantics, machine translation, and other applications. We're going to kind of see how the, those core tools and models can then be built out to solve all of these different problems and a sort of brief tour of what the state of the art looks like in each of these areas. So that's where we're headed. And that's it for this segment. Here, thank you.